Welcome everybody to the Actions on Claims Overpayments webinar. My name is Tom Ryan. I'll be your presenter for today. I'm also joined by Leanne Foster from my team. She's going to act as technical support, work with the questions that are in chat and provide different answers to you hopefully if we need to. This webinar is in response to questions you asked. So what happens is we've done previous webinars on actions on claims. So as we went through those, we got questions on overpayments, which then led us to say, maybe we need to do one just specifically on overpayments. So with that said, I would encourage you to also put those comments into your surveys. We look at those. That's what drove this particular webinar. I want to let you know a couple of things going on right now. First, we had some very specific questions about how to use our portal and what's going on with that section. Now, that is the secure section or the login section of our website. I want to let you know that we are looking at enhancing that and we're doing some back end work on it. It's going to increase the programming and the servers. What it's going to do for you is make it more stable and faster. It's also going to do that by changing the look and feel. What's not changing is functionality. So when I talk about the different things you can do with overpayments in the portal today, those functions will still be there. They just may not be there in the same manner. So when do we anticipate that coming in? By end of spring 2024. So end of spring is mid-June-ish. Not sure exactly what the time frame is between now and then, but before June-ish, of 2024 will get you more information as that comes up. So that's our first tip. And to help answer some of those first questions, yes, we are gonna talk about the portals. We're gonna talk about that secure section as we go through. Let's take a moment to talk about our disclaimer. This education was prepared and is current. Now this education is guidance only. The actual current rules, laws, and regulations are on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. So some of the information will be referred back to that. But again, we prepared this information. It's accurate as of today. It could change. So with that, any responses that I give are based on the facts that you gave me. A couple of you gave me some um, questions and I'll do the best I can to respond, but I will let you know that if you have additional questions based on what I'm giving you, we'll need you to put them back in chat and I'll let you know if I need that. CMS does prohibit you from recording this presentation for profit making purposes. This is written into the internet only manual or the day to day operating instructions. Now, because we cannot ensure how you're using a recording that you're doing, we ask that you don't do a recording screen print or anything else. Instead, what we'll do is record it post it to our YouTube channel and you'll have the opportunity to look at some on demands based on that and their encore presentations. So you can go ahead and use that as a recording instead of doing it yourself. A little bit easier for you. What are we gonna talk about and what's our goal for the day? Well, today our goal is to help you understand the Medicare overpayment process. So I'm on slide three with the agenda items going on. Our goal is to get you that basic understanding to answer the questions that you've given us. So in order to do that, we wanna cover the process. We're gonna talk about how to return money and we're gonna do options for disagreements. So overall, this is what we're looking at. Now, as we go through some of these, I will give you various resources. I'm gonna show you various things. If you download the presentation, everything I'm showing to you, at least at the highest level will be linked. So when I move through something and say it's in the portal user manual, go here. And then I walk you through the steps to find what you need inside that. The portal user manual will be linked, but maybe not all the different steps just so you're well aware of what's going on there. To begin, again, we do want to talk about the overpayment process. I will tell you that the first few slides that I built in were to answer questions based on what people were asking me. And some of them were, were very basic because they're new to Medicare and they said, hey, I need a little background. So they said, you know, what is the overpayment process and what are you referring to? The next question is, what's a general understanding of the topic or what do I need to know about this topic? So that's my goal during this section, and we will have questions after this section. We want to keep the information at that general level or the high level to make sure that we're meeting those basic needs. Because if I don't build the background to meet the basic needs, when we get to the next two sections, it won't make sense. So let's get started with that. Of course, what's the first thing I need to do? Well, define what an overpayment is. And in order to do this, we're gonna to move to the Department of Health and Human Services versus the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So in the hierarchy, the president is the head of our executive branch. They execute the laws, okay? Underneath there, you've got the Department of Health and Human Services. This is the secretary that sits on his board. And then underneath the Department of Health and Human Services is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. 
Then underneath the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services are contractors and other people that actually make the program function. So this is one up. This is the, above the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And a couple of people did have questions on how all of this plays together. It also factors into the process. And we're going to talk more about that in just a little while. So the Department of Health and Human Services says this is a payment exceeding regulation and statutes that are properly payable. It is a debt owed to the federal government. Let's just break that down and make it super simple. It means that Medicare paid something it shouldn't. And because it was not supposed to be paid, now the provider or person that was paid for it has to pay it back. So there are times when, yes, a beneficiary who was paid for a service may be responsible for paying the federal government back. There are also times when an overpayment can occur due to a Medicare secondary payer situation, and another insurance is responsible for paying us such as an auto insurance due to an accident or something like that. So an overpayment is not just regarding a provider. It can be a provider, a patient, or a beneficiary, as they're known for Medicare. It could also be another payer. It's anyone paid by Medicare. And that's the first question that someone had for me was, does it just mean to the provider? And the answer is no. All right, so we know what it is. Again, improper payment sent out to somebody. Now that Medicare's discovered it, we got to ask for it back. All right. What are some of the common reasons that this was another question that was asked? So what causes overpayments was the literal question um, from the previous webinars. I would put this right in. First of all, I want to let you know this is not an all inclusive list. It's just some of the high level reasons, the higher reasons, also the most common reasons. So we'll talk about that. Incorrect coding is a very common reason, and this could be something where upon medical review, they discover that a claim does not meet the standard that it was coded at. For instance, an evaluation management was coded higher or lower or lower than it was supposed to be. So that's where an overpayment would come in. If it was coded higher and we lowered it, then there's obviously money that's owed. So that's how we would do incorrect coding. Insufficient documentation. This means that we ask for something or we're looking for something, but the documentation doesn't support what was built insufficiently. Now, keep in mind, insufficient documentation is commonly done when we find an error based on not having an order for a service. We'll talk a little bit more about that one um, in specific to some of the other processes that go with it. But insufficient documentation means that you sent in documentation, but just something's not right there. Medical necessity errors. Again, this one is very simple. Within the documentation that you submitted to us and when we looked at it, and when I say us, I'm talking about the Medicare program and not your Medicare Administrative Contractor or MAC, which is WPS, us being the overall global Medicare program. So medical necessity, the documentation sent in does not support the medical necessity for this service. Now, one of the things that came up as a question was, my doctor or my practitioner was trained at certain thing is medically necessary. However, Medicare says it's not. So when you say medical necessity, what are we talking about? And remember, this is based in the medical necessity rules as set forth by Medicare. So Medicare medical necessity, not necessarily medical necessity as set forth through your practitioner, through your ambulance supplier, through your durable medical equipment supplier, through that. It's all set forth in the Medicare information. That's what we're looking at when we talk about an overpayment for not medically necessary. Um, there are also times when there are processing in other administrative errors, uh, bundling, automated edits are examples of this. A couple of questions came in on bundling in particular, um, and then we talk about bundling to start with. There are multiple forms of bundling in the medic program. One of the questions was regarding inpatient bundling, and what that means is that if a service is performed and the patient is inpatient in a facility of any kind, there are certain times when that facility is the only one payable for those services. So that's inpatient bundling. Also, there are other times when there's National Correct Coding Initiative or NCCI edits. These edits are designed to put procedures together. These two procedures, when built together, will not be payable. The first one is payable, the second one is not. That's a procedure to procedure bundling. There's also another form of bundling that's done, for instance, under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule that says this service is never payable, even when billed alone. It's not payable, it's automatically bundled into another service. 
Even if that's the only service that you ever build this Mac for, that patient doesn't matter. So bundling comes in a variety of formats. It doesn't matter though if a service should have been bundled and somehow went through. And then later we find out that it should have been bundled. We'll talk more about that. We will take the payment back and that becomes an overpayment. And again, I'll, I'll describe that a little bit more, but I just want you to be aware of it. Someone asked me about automated edits and what does that mean? And that would be one of the examples that came with that inpatient bundling. So inpatient and outpatient claims are billed differently. Outpatient claims can be billed as they occur. So they occur today, tomorrow you bill it. Inpatient claims, not the same thing. They have to bill in a certain order. They have to have a certain time frame. So all of a sudden, outpatient claim that paid because it was done on the second is already paid. The inpatient claim doesn't get billed till after the month is done. There are automated edits that will say, nope, this patient was inpatient at the time. The outpatient claim that was previously paid should not have been. And therefore, a letter is generated asking you for the money back. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about types of automated edits. Now that's just one example and there's other automated edits that do work in. And a lot of those edits are also built into the primary payer information edits. So another type of this would be when Medicare is responsible for considering charges after a different insurance or a different payer has considered charges. We don't always use the term insurance because that's not necessarily correct. Someone could be self-insured such as a store and you follow the store and so they don't have liability insurance, they're self-insured, they're a payer. So there's a variety of different factors that go into that, but it's whenever someone is responsible for paying before Medicare or at least considering the charges. And how does that work? There is a set of updates that goes into play. When that system is updated, it's the coordination of benefits system, when that system is updated, if anything is in processing, it will stop it from paying. If something has processed and it is after the effective date, then it will say, hey, give us the money back because you didn't tell us about this. Or it could even be something where there is no effective debt because they're still in doing development and it could affect a lot of claims. So there's a variety of different things that happen. The last one is eligibility issues. Now keep in mind, we're not saying you're not eligible for Medicare Part A and B. Yes, that may be a part of it. But there's also eligibility issues related to billing the correct payer. So this should have been railroad Medicare versus Medicare Advantage versus traditional fee for service part A and B Medicare versus a durable medical equipment. So there's a variety of different factors that all go into this. And if any of those come up, those are all considered part of that eligibility file that comes through. And so then create bigger issues. So once we've paid and we shouldn't have, we got to take the money back for any of these reasons, plus so many more that you may not be aware of. Um, the question that came in that I really wanted to address is what are the two biggest issues we're currently seeing? Um, the number one biggest issue is always gonna be primary payer information or Medicare secondary payer. When there's someone else before us that is responsible, that is our biggest um, overpayment issue. And so that's why we even have a section on our overpayment form that you can check a box for it, okay? So that's a big one. Number two is eligibility issue, but not necessarily part A and B, and are they eligible? It's all the other stuff that relates to it um, and goes into those different portions. So keep that in mind, those are our biggest issues, but primary payer by far is the biggest one that we definitely do face. Let's talk a little bit about how they're identified, because this was a question that came in, in, in how are the different contractors involved and why are they involved, for instance? So let's talk about identifying. First, your Medicare contractors can identify this. And your Medicare administrative contractor, as we process claims, will ask for certain pieces of information or do post-payment reviews asking for pieces of information. And if that is not provided, first of all, then it's considered a no document generic, which means no medical necessity decision was made. Also, we could make a medical necessity decision, in which case we're gonna take money back based on a post-payment review. Okay, now remember, we're not talking about prepayment reviews in this case because you wouldn't have an overpayment if you never got paid for it. It does mean that we could potentially not pay the claim, but that's not what we're talking about during this course. Another contract is the comprehensive error rate testing contractor. And their goal is not to necessarily find errors. Instead, they create a report called the National Paid Claims Error Rate, 
which has turned over to the Congress and a variety of other government entities to look at how Medicare is doing in terms of paying claims correctly. So their goal is this report. In doing that, they will sample a nation from all contractors, anyone involved with Medicare, except for Medicare Advantage plans, because they're focusing on traditional A and B Medicare, a claim. Now, it could be a variety of things for a variety of reasons. They, do, they don't have a like set target audience or a target claim or a target goal or anything like that. It is a sample of claims. And what they're looking at is just to see how we are processing claims and were they processed correctly based on this error rate. And then they create a report. So again, they're gonna do a claim and if they find an error during the medical review portion of it, then they will ha ask us, the Medicare administrative contractor, to take the money back. So we become an affiliated contractor under that program. The recovery audit program, which is run the recovery audit contractor, is another post pay medical review. Now, this one is a targeted program. They pick a specific topic, they propose it to CMS, and they go out and target those reviews. They can do automated and complex reviews. What you have to be aware of with this is if you don't respond, it's the same exact process. Same exact process. They'll come back and say, give the money back, but they notify the Medicare administrative contractor with that. And they do have a special process before they do that because they're paid based on errors that they find and that means money that they recover. So their process is a little different and there's one extra step in between. And we will just highlight that when we come to some of the other information later on. There's a qualified independent contractor. Now this is a level um, to contractor for appeals. It's a little bit different. It's not part of the federal entity government yet. It's just a separate contractor. So what they do is they look at the level two appeal to see if it was done correctly. Well, this appeal could also be done on an overpayment saying, we don't feel we owe Medicare this money. Here's why we don't owe Medicare this money. So we're appealing the overpayment and they will do that as well. Now, again, it is not a claims appeal. It is an overpayment appeal different there. Process exactly this, but different type of an appeal because you're looking at something different. The quality improvement organization can also tell us to take money back. Now again, they're going to indicate to the Medicare administrative contract. If you don't know what the quality improvement organization is, their job is to look at issues with quality, issues where claims shouldn't have been paid. They may not meet for a variety of factors or other types of things. Um, so there's a variety of different factors that go into that. So they're the quality improvement organization. So if a patient files a quality issue and it's determined that because of that quality issue, it needs to go onto the UPIC, the um, Unified Program Integrity Contractor for Fraud and Abuse Investigation, the quality improvement organization could then tell us to take money back as well. So could the UPIC actually technically, and, and they're a fraud and abuse investigator. So these are all different forms of contractors that Medicare uses. Now, who else can identify an overpayment? A patient can. This has happened many times where the patient says, I didn't have that service. Nope, they call 1-800-MEDICARE and they say, nope, didn't have that service, don't know who this provider is. So then what'll happen is we'll actually ask you for medical records as the provider community. And we'll say, hey, what do you have to show that you did this? Sometimes that triggers to say, wait, this wasn't the right patient or wait, this wasn't the right data service or oops, we billed it under the wrong provider. Oh, okay, so the patient started it, we've discovered something wrong and we still have to take the money back and you still have to get that billed correctly. Providers can also do this. Sometimes providers keep it as simple as, you know, mm, hey, we didn't bill that one correct, so take the money back on that, it's gonna rebill it here. That's fine. We wanna make sure that that happens. Um, so an overpayment can occur and can be initiated by a provider. Other times there's payer information and this is the big one that I talked about. Remember I said that, Medicare secondary payer program, or when there's a primary payer, this is our biggest focus. So again, providers do identify this. On the other hand, there are federal and government entities that can do this well, that can identify overpayments and ask us to take money back, starting with the Office of Inspector General. For those of you that don't know, they're the legal watchdog for the Department of Health and Human Services. And because the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is under the Department of Health and Human Services, they do look at that. Now they're the same level, the same exact level as this as CMS. Okay. The job is then to look at a variety of claims and to give recommendations, etc. But if they find errors, we do have to take the money back as your Medicare administrative contractor. If you fail a 
front of the investigation, you maybe refer to the Federal Bureau of Investigation during that time. Again, this is a law enforcement agency, right? If the law enforcement agency says, take money back, we will take your money back. On the other hand, it could wind up in a federal district court or judicial review and all of those different things totally separately. So keep in mind that the Federal Bureau of Investigation may instruct us to do that depending on what they find. As I said, CMS reports to the Department of Health and Human Services. So if there's something paid in error and either CMS or DHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, determines that they want the money taken back, we will do that. Um, and then you have to go through the legal process. Okay. Last is the judicial review. Now this is a level five appeal. So all the way up the chain of appeals, you do get to the federal district court, and this is a judicial review. And during that level five, they can order us to take money back, partial overpayment. They could do a full overpayment, anything on a claim that was paid. So we have experienced that before, and we wanted to let you know about that. So again, these are who will identify them and where they'll start. It is not the only people that can. If anyone else identifies it for any reason, um, then we begin to look at it from a variety of different aspects. But again, we do have to, once identified, at least take a look at it and determine whether or not their money is owed to Medicare. Also, we talked about this, and I did mention it briefly before, but the system can also identify this. These are built-in edits. They're programmable. And what they do is, as the systems communicate back and forth, it may determine that this claim should not have been paid for a variety of reasons. One of the systems that you must be aware of when you talk about Medicare and overpayments is the common working file. Now, a couple people ask questions on this and how this plays into an overpayment. First, the common working file is the communication hub between all Medicare systems. When I'm talking Medicare, I'm not just talking about part A and B. This would be part C, this would be part D, this would be a variety of other systems. It's that talking file. So if something comes in and says, hey, wait, this claim affects this claim, so take money back here, system. The common working file can do that without anyone manually looking at it. It's built-in edits that will do that. They are automated. What they will do then is send a notice to the Medicare administrative contractor to open an accounts receivable. The system can automatically open an accounts receivable and send you a nice letter explaining why it did that without us ever touching it. And that's why we have the overpayment appeals process in place. That's where some of this comes from. So keep in mind, I want you to be aware of that because sometimes I'm going to say, no, you're going to have to file an appeal on it because no one's ever looked at that. It was a system edit. It's a system programmable edit that opened it. Now, can the Mac have certain edits that will program or trigger this in? Absolutely. And these are specific. The common working file are national. The Mac are jurisdictional. Jurisdictional is a series of states. So for instance, WPS is the administrative contractor or MAC for J5 and J8. The states are Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and the national Part A contract, which is UB04 and um, 837I claims built to the physical intermediary standard or shared system. We are also J8 MAC, which means Indiana and Michigan. So we can build certain trigger claims that will happen. One of those on the system slide would be something related to an LCD or other types of edits like that that are very specific to us. Yeah. Last, along with the common working file being able to build it, there is a national system. And you heard me mention the system, one of the systems before. This is the physical intermediary standard system, this. This processes UB04 and 837I claims. There's a national contractor who controls this system and builds national edits. So unlike the MAC programmable edits, which are just local, there's the national edits, and they can also trigger an overpayment. All right. And also along with FIS, the physical media standard or shared system, is the multi-carrier system, or MCS. This system is for 1,500 claims and 837P electronic transaction claims. So they can be different. And sometimes due to the type of claims that are sent in, the national system edits and local edits are different. But sometimes it's gonna trigger in a certain manner for a hospital versus a physician. And it just depends on the type of edit that is built. Okay, let's move on. Medical review. Please keep in mind 
that when I'm talking about medical review for this purpose, I'm only going to talk about complex medical review because the system edits are what they call a form of non complex medical review. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to say, hey, there's system edits and we're going to move on. Medical review must consist of a registered nurse or a specialist at a minimum. What does that mean? A PT can review things for physical therapy. All right, we could have a social worker look at certain things when it's a licensed clinical social worker as Medicare. But a registered nurse is a general person who can look at almost any record and determine whether or not there are certain elements missing. However, they're not alone. As a contractor under medical review, you have to have a contract medical director or a contractor medical director, CMD. This is a doctor, whether it is a doctor of medicine or osteopathy, it is a doctor, and they have to be able to work with these departments. That's why it's complex. A person has to request and look at medical records. Um, one of the questions that came in is during complex medical review, does the person, the nurse in this case, have to look at and actually send out a notice saying, hey, I need these records. No, the system can generate the request, but the records must be reviewed by a person. So hopefully that makes sense a little bit differently there. Um, what can a nurse do or what could they say? They can say, yep, we're not even doing medical necessity. We're not doing anything about a medical review because you didn't send in something that's needed. So you didn't send in the signatures, the patient or the provider signatures. We're not gonna go any further. You didn't send in an order. Well, if you don't order this service, why are you doing this? Therefore, it's not medically, we're not gonna medically review it because we don't have an order, so that shouldn't have been done in the first place. So there are a variety of factors that play into that. They can also look for medical necessity. And there's a variety of different factors that play into this. They can also say, you know, it's a billing error. Now, a billing error could be something like overpayment, underpayment, uh, build on the wrong data service, build with the wrong places service. So all kinds of different things come into that. It's not that it wasn't a medically necessary service, it's that something else is wrong. The other one that CMS leaves us is what we call the other category on a complex medical review. And it is just that. It could be anything else that doesn't define any of the other elements. So a lot of things will fall into that. However, it's rarely used because most of them fit into one of the other three categories. Okay. As part of this, what is the process? This was the next question. What is the process that we use to determine an overpayment? So let's talk about this. So what happens is first, somehow the overpayment is identified. And again, this could be complex, this could be non-complex, this could be an edit, something happens. Once the overpayment is identified and accounts receivable or AR is built, it's built in high glass, which is the accounting system. So the Medicare accounting system, we build this accounts receivable, then that starts. All right, here's what happens next. A recoupment request letter is sent. Now we do track these within the portal and I'll show you that in just a little while, but we do have an area where you can actually take a look at this when the letter, you can find out details, a variety of other things. So recoupment is sent. Providers have a couple of options. They could not respond, in which case we're just gonna take our money back and we're gonna offset that at some point in the future. We'll talk more about that because it doesn't begin right away. It's gonna talk about that in timeframes, which is two, two away from here. If you do respond, you can say, hey, go ahead and immediately offset that. Start taking the money today. Or you can say, you know what, hold off. We wanna file an appeal because we don't agree you owe the money. So you can give us the money, you can not respond, you can ask us to take it back right now, or you can say, hey, hold off, no, no. So a variety of things happen. In the end, all accounts receivable have to be closed. If they're not closed, we do have to refer them on to the federal government, to the treasury. And the treasury then has to begin to work with them that process is outside of anything I can talk about. What the Treasury does is their issue. So we aren't going to get into the Treasury stuff. I will tell you, though, when we refer to the Treasury. All right, so let's talk about how we notify you. We do have to send you a letter explaining the reasons. Cannot just say, hey, you owe us money. It has to tell you why you owe us money, what the claims are, all of that. What is the total amount due and how we calculated that amount? Because sometimes it's not the total claim, right? It may be, hey, for a Part B claim, you owe us on these three lines, but not these three lines. 
So what's the total amount due? Or it could be something where, hey, on this service, you said it was billed at this level, but it really should have been this level. Therefore, you owe us this portion, but not that portion. That's why we're going to explain. Then we're also going to tell you the calculations. Each letter must give you your rights and obligations as it relates to Medicare. So that's your key right there. You, can it tell you, can you do an appeal? Can you not do an appeal? When do you have to have it paid by? All of those different things. We must also identify which patients are affected and the service for that patient. What we will do is identify the provider by sending it to that provider. So again, sending it to the provider identifies the provider. Okay. Um, and we do use the information in PICOS or the Provider Enrollment Chain and Ownership System to send this letter. So when it's your information is not correct in our enrollment system, you're not going to necessarily get this letter. So that's why it's key to keep this up to date, right? Like when you owe us money, don't you want to know right away? So we want to make sure we keep that up to date. Also, the letter will explain our interest rates and how they will apply. So if you don't pay us back in X amount of days, we're going to start putting interest on that. We'll talk more about that too. All right, let's talk about some of the time frames. So you know you're going to get there, but how does this all start? Well, first, for the provider community, day one begins with the day the letter is written and sent. Day one. Now, on day 15, this is the last day to file a rebuttal. A rebuttal is a written statement saying, I don't agree that I'm going to owe it and I'm going to do something else to stop this from happening. Okay, well, that makes sense. On day 16, this is the first day you can ask us to do an immediate recoupment. Now, you could ask on day 1 through 15, but the first day we'll actually begin is on day 16. An immediate recoupment is where you ask us to offer payment for your claims because you owe us this money. And therefore, hey, just start offsetting. Go on and tell us on the remittance notice when you send us the claim that it was offset for this over or for the overpayment. That's what an immediate recoupment is. Day 30 is your last day to file appeal to stop interest. I do want you to note that day 120, way listed down below, is the last day to file a redetermination, which is the appeal. Day 30, though, is the last day to file it to stop interest. What that means is we will not start on, um, we will not take the money back until everything is put in place. Okay. So uh, day 31, interest does begin. Day 40 is the last day to pay to avoid a recoupment, which is that offset where we're just going to take the money back on future claims. On day 41, the offset does begin. Day 60 to 90, um, intent to refer for accounts not paid in full. If something that can happen, you can tell, tell us that you're going to do this, or we can send you a letter saying, hey, we're going to refer you. Now, what does a referral mean? It means we're going to move you to the Treasury Department if we have to wait some to get our money back and then it becomes the treasury department's information on day 91 the, it is considered delinquent accounts on day 120 this is the last day to file your redetermination this is your level one appeal if you know that due to a rebuttal up here we know that you're going to do this redetermination then we won't file you or we won't turn you over to the treasury but without that we potentially could when we do file it within that last 30 days, we then do notify the Treasury, say, hey, this has been filed. Do you want to hold off on this? And they typically will wait. All right, but notice that the final referral does go at day 121 to 150. This is when we're mandated to do it. So we do contact to delinquent accounts. Um, there is a variety of factors that play into all of this, especially with the Treasury contacts. The final date of referral is here. During the day 91 to 120, um, we can contact you as well. If, if there's a variety of other factors, we could contact you. And it really just depends on the type of referral and what's going on. Someone asked if, uh, could we contact someone like a lawyer during this time frame? And the answer is yes, if it's related to a legal situation, uh, such as a car accident under the Medicare secondary payer information, then some of this stuff would not necessarily be to the provider, it would be to a lawyer. Um, so an overpayment can occur in both mechanisms. Um, so I do think that that's important to understand. And the reason that I just answered that question is because I forgot to put a slide here. And the next slide should actually be questions. So if you guys have questions, put them in chat. Uh, I want to answer a couple of pre-submitted questions and then we'll move on um, and we'll talk about some of the other things that should happen next. So another pre-submitted question that we had um, in this area was, what is the allotment for time with the five days that they talk about 
And the actual, I'm going to, going to make an assumption here. And so if I'm wrong, put this in chat. The five days that we talk about is a mailing day allotment. So really when we talk about day as the date of the letter, we do allow five additional days. So it would really be day six before we start the clock. Now that is just sure um, how to do that. And what the goal of that is to say, hey, you got it in the mail. We allowed a couple extra days. So we weren't saying it was done that day. Um, so that is definitely a key question. At this point, I'm going to stop and ask Leanne uh, if there's any uh, questions. And Tom, we do have one question. The question is asking for a little bit of clarification on the difference between rebuttal and redetermination. Oh, all right, sure. Um, rebuttal, let's start there. Rebuttal is an intermediary step that does not need to be done. Key thing, it doesn't need to be done. It is a step to say, I intend to do something else. So it's a letter to us to say, I intend to do something else. Some people don't do that and that's fine. Other people will do it and what they're looking for is to say, I'm going to get around to filing this redetermination or I'm going to get around to filing an extended repayment schedule. I just haven't got that far yet. Now, we haven't learned what an extended repayment schedule is, but a rebuttal is important with that. And I'll talk more about that uh, just coming up under payment methodologies. A redetermination is different than a rebuttal. A redetermination is the first level of appeal and it, be, it does begin or ends the 120 days to file it by. Now, just like a claim redetermination, yes, you file first level to the MAC. That's the first level of appeal redetermination. Then you move to second, third, fourth, and fifth, and you must file it appropriately within each set time frame. So rebuttal, just a letter explaining what you intend to do, redetermination, the actual formal step of doing an appeal. Hopefully I explained that well enough. If not, I want you to put that back in the chat. In the meantime, Leanne, do we have any other questions? We do not have any more, qu any other questions at this time. Let's uh, move on to return the money. This is the next section, and this is just some different options you guys have to return the money. And I do want to talk a little bit about some of the diff those different options, and I want to show you where to find different things. Um, so we'll talk about this going forward. So when you look at returning the money, the first thing you need to do before you return the money is determine if you should return the money, because you don't know if you should file an appeal or do some of the other things if you haven't done this. Now, let's say that you do say, yep, I need to return the money. I agree with you. Okay, this is where we can do this. First, your options are paper. You can send us a paper check. If you do that, please include the copy of the letter that we sent you. This has some key pieces of information and will help tie the two together. I say that and it sounds very basic. Let me talk about this. Paper checks. Paper checks come in and we get a check and we're like, what does this go to? I see a provider who has this name. Is this really their check? Or wait, this is a group and I've got 12 providers under it. What, what are you trying to do with this check? We will hold out. We try to determine it. So it's always better to send in that information right away, but it is an option. Electronically in the WPS portal. And then we're going to do an offset. Now, immediate recoupment request form is where you say, hey, I want you to start offsetting right now. You can also have the option of just not paying it back, which means we'll offset it later. Now, any of these options do not mean that you do not have the right to file that 120 days within the appeal. That's great. You still have that right. We're not taking that away. Before I leave this slide, I do want to stop for a second and move to the website. I want to show you a couple of things because uh, we did have some questions about where to find the paper form and some information on the portal. So I want to get through that. Let's jump to the website. Uh, so let's jump to WPS and we're going to go ahead and jump to the first page. First thing I want you to know, if you're looking for portal information, right here is the portal. Now, this is where you could electronically file the request, and you can also electronically send money back. This is also the area where you can go in to look up and see a request letter that has been sent. Okay, right here. Portal user manual is where I recommend. Now, why do I recommend it? I cannot log into the portal. I don't have access to the PHI and PII, and I don't have a need for that for training purposes. It's too much. So in order to be safe, we just use the portal user manual. We then scroll down, and you can download the entire manual right up here by the green button. This will be a PDF. Take a look. It's great. Otherwise, move down to the bottom. And again, I'm just scrolling down to the bottom. The first thing you're looking for is the claims transaction and searches. This is a claims transaction, right? We're not going to take money back if we haven't paid you for a claim. Therefore, it's part of the claims transactions. But then we keep going down. And here's where you can file an appeal, appeal submission if you want to. You can check the status of your appeal. Now, this could be related to an overpayment appeal. It doesn't necessarily have to be a claim appeal. And then you hit the financial center. Now, 
inside the financial center, you can search for an existing overpayment to find out information on it. You can also send us a refund. So you can do this. You can look at the um, accounts payable hold search. You can do any of a variety of different things here. And you just want to take a look at these different features to see which one you want. In particular, the submitting and a field refund, or you want to search the refunds, go ahead and check out those different things. Um, a couple of people had questions on finding like you didn't get your letter or you want more information or maybe you have someone in between like a third party that gets those letters. So what do you do with all of that? You can use the overpayment search, go ahead and select it. It's going to work just like this for any of the sections. Scroll through, it'll tell you what you need and what you have to look at. If you don't have this information, this will not work for you. Just letting you know right up front. We have to have something to tie it back to, okay? So hopefully all of that makes sense for you regarding those different types of things. Again, as a reminder, yes, you can file an appeal. We did have a couple of people who said, you know, we've, we're under some financial burden and what do we do in this case? Like, we know we owe Medicare the money, but we can't figure out what to do because we don't have it all to pay back right now. And if we pay back right now, we're gonna wind up in a lot of financial trouble as a business. Medicare is not looking for that to happen. What Medicare is looking for then is for you to tell us how much can you afford to pay back and when do you expect to complete this? This is what's called an extended repayment schedule. This is when you could file a rebuttal. You could say, hey, here's something I need to know. We're going to pay you back. We're going to get you an extended repayment schedule. And here's what you have to know during that time. This is what the rebuttal would be used for. This is the most common use for a rebuttal. You can remember a rebuttal is simply telling us you're going to take a further action. Now, I've seen rebuttals used to tell us you're going to file a redetermination. Great. Just simply file the redetermination. It's easier. Could you do a rebuttal? Sure. But the most common use is when we're going to get an extended repayment schedule put into place. So what is the extended repayment schedule? Again, you agree you owe Medicare money. But because you owe Medicare money, if we take all that back right now, we'll put you into a financial hardship. So this means that we are not looking for a full refund within 30 days. Instead, we're looking for you to complete this extended repayment schedule. So you have 15 days to file the rebuttal and another 15 days to give us the first payment with the extended repayment schedule. You have 36 months to repay it. If you cannot do that within 36 months, then we do have to go to CMS for approval. Keep in mind, if it's longer than 36, that's fine. We're not saying we're not going to approve it, what we are saying is it has to be a special CMS approval. So it could or could not be approved. We don't know that. Typically, if it's under that, it's automatically going to be approved and WPS will be fine with it. All right. So what you need to do again, send us a letter explaining why you want the extended repayment schedule and what's going on with it. And then if there's any interest that applies. So keep in mind, even though you say, hey, I'm going to give you the money back eventually, interest doesn't stop applying you still owe Medicare a debt. However, as you pay it back, it will reduce the amount of money interest is applied to, just like anything else. So that's what the extended repayment schedule is for. Again, the number one purpose use of a rebuttal is to tell us you're going to do this. This is really what the rebuttal does for us. A couple people um, did ask me on this, like where they would find information. So let's just take a quick look at this. Get on the website. Instead of going to a bunch of other places, just come right to the claims, I'm sorry, the overpayment section. So right at the top, we're gonna go topic and we're gonna go overpayments. Now, if you wanna do an A to Z sort, however you wanna do that, you can go down and you'll there's an item called extended repayment schedule. Look it up, it's gonna give you a full article on it. We're good. If you said, hey, didn't find that and I'm looking for something else, that's okay. Uh, go ahead and select a different section depending on where you're at. There's the extended repayment schedule and the interest information. If you want to set us a form with it, go ahead and drop over to forms. You can see we do have a checklist here, which then acts as the form. So there's a variety of different pieces of information that are available. Um, so if you're interested in that, I do recommend that you take a look both at the form and the Oracle to help you through that process. I'm gonna tell you that there's gonna be a slide on your deck and it's slide seven, I think it's slide 16 on your it's called the Medicare Appeals Council Review. That slide needs to be moved down and I'll show it to you in a little while. I'll talk about it. I did put it in the wrong order. That's completely on me. So now we're back to some questions. Um, 
I did answer the first question already because it was where do I locate those forms? And so let me again show you. If you're looking at the overpayment form, if you're looking at the rebuttal form, it is all going to be under claims. Again, we're in the claims section. We're talking about claims areas. Okay, claims, forms right here, upper right. The only exception to this is if you need one of the appeals forms because that's not going to be in claims. That will be in appeals. If you go into appeals and you go to forms, this is where you're going to find the redetermination request. Okay, that's what you're looking for here. So that's where you're going to find those different forms. If you have a little bit more, let me know. Uh, Leanne, do we have any other questions? We do have a couple. Um, the first one would be, what would be an example of something else that would be done when filing a rebuttal? So almost anything can be an example, but the, again, the primary primary reason for a rebuttal put in place is the extended repayment schedule. Do we have any other uh, questions? We did have one more the question was why does medicare pay and adjust on claims then take back and resend with co 132 for payment to come from neu health all right so this is a, a set of set of information and it depends on the specific situation the contractual uh, obligation which is the co does mean that so if i want to look up because i'm not sure what 132 is so i want to look that up first so what i'm going to do is i'm going to come to the claims i'm going to come to tools so right here it's called tools I'm going to scroll down, and I'm just going to say all tools. And underneath all tools, we should have got to find the right one. It's a lookup tool, and what it's going to do is give us the reasons and remarks code. You can see it's way down here in this lower left corner for me. Um, I just want to check out and see what a 132 is so that I at least have a little bit more information. 132. Prearranged demonstration project adjustment. This is what I needed to verify in case you're wondering. So what it is, is NEU Health has a certain uh, contract with Medicare and it's called a demonstration project. So it's not necessarily about everything in general, it's just about services. Now NEU Health files claims under the demonstration project in a certain manner. So your claim may be paid and that's fine, but then because it's part of the demonstration project, it actually gets taken back um, almost as if it should have gone to a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, keep in mind, this is not a Medicare Advantage plan. This is a demonstration project. It's a very specific project with this. And so I think um, hopefully that answers your question. If not, let me know. But again, remember, it's a separately prearranged demonstration project that says certain things must be paid by NEU Health. NEU Health is under that demonstration project, so that's why it comes back with the CO 132, because even though you were paid previously, when they filed their claim, letting us know that this should be within the demonstration project, it's one of those automated reviews you heard me talk about earlier. So hopefully that answers the question. If not, throw some more into chat for me. All right, Leanne, any other questions? Uh, I'm not able to hear Leanne, but I am scrolling through, and I just found a question that says, can you give an example of a demonstration project? Um, I, I cannot actually give an example of a demonstration project. I'm not sure which demonstration product they have. What happens if, if you look at the CMS website, they do put out calls for demonstrations and they put out calls for various types of projects. Some of them are very specific to providers. Other ones are not about providers and they're in general and you have to enroll within them and you have to go through special stuff to be approved by them. And then the common working file gets an uh, information update that says that you're in the demonstration product. Um, so sometimes a demonstration product was used when we first started certain types of Medicare Advantage plans. We used demonstration products for some of them. Um, I'm trying to remember other types. There was a certain type of care plan that was put in place. And so that means that if this patient has this condition and sees these providers and all of this care should be provided by this provider. Um, to give you an example, kind of like SNF consolidated billing, when, they, when they're under the care of the skilled nursing facility, it becomes that type of situation type of bundling, but it's really about a certain thing under a demonstration project, and I'm not familiar with that demonstration project, so I can't give you a better example. Uh, with that, that's the last question I see submitted, Leanne. Was there any other questions that you are aware of? There are no additional questions at this time. All right, let's go ahead and move on here. And we want to talk about what happens if you disagree. And this is a key subject. It's pretty easy to move through though. First, if you disagree, you file that rebuttal. We already talked about this. This is a letter explaining why the Mac should not recoup money. You get 15 days to do this. 
but you can provide evidence. This does not stop interest and it's not part of the appeals process. And this means, hey, I don't intend to do this. It's also used with the extended repayment schedules and a variety of other things, but it is just something you can do. On the other hand, the formal appeal process is what would close the accounts receivable enough to reconsider it. There's a rack discussion period. So when the recovery audit contractor has a finding, you can go back to them and say, hey, I don't agree with your finding. You have 30 days from the informational letter, which is just an automated review, or from a review results letter, which is from a complex review, to tell them, I don't agree with you. Here's why. Here's this discussion period, and I want to do this. Um, now, again, we're not involved in that process, so it's not something that we really have anything um, other than that information to give you. But if you want to learn more, I do recommend that you take a look at the Medicare fee-for-service recovery audit page. It's available on the CMS website. The link right here on the slide will open it up for you so you can go ahead and take a look at that. As I've said many different times, you do have the right to file an appeal. Take a look at this. This is the same as a claim appeal. It's the same five levels. Nothing changes. The time frames are the same. Nothing changes with the exception of one thing. When you file the appeal, it needs to state overpayment appeal, not claim appeal. Overpayment appeal. Otherwise, you're going from the original claim date, which isn't going to help you. If you do have the slides downloaded and you're interested and you want to look at this booklet, select the booklet. It'll actually be a link to that MLM booklet to help you through the appeals process. You do have 30 days to file to stop the recoupment. Now, this is at a level one and level two. So redetermination, reconsideration. What that means is that while you have 120 days at a level one and 180 days to file, if you want us to stop the recoupment, we won't take the money back. We're going to let your payments go through until after we make a decision. Then you have 30 days to file the appeal. So it is key to make sure that you are aware of that. Um, it does delay Medicare ta from taking the money back while the appeals decision is made kind of stops that back and forth. But keep in mind, interest does still apply during this time frame. Now, we will erase the interest and the appeal if or, and the overpayment if we agree with your appeal. All right, this is the slide that we moved and we wanted to talk a little bit about this because I have some questions. This is when it leaves the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and goes under the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the Department of Appeals Board. It's the Appeals Council Review. This is before it hits a through judicial review. So it's still an administrative type review, but it's not under CMS. And that's why level four is a little different. What they're doing is they're looking at this level to make sure that the previous levels have been able to do what they did. Legally, did they have the right to do all of those different things? Sometimes this means that they don't necessarily look at medical necessity. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. If not, throw it in chat. We'll get back to you. Common issue with overpayment appeals that I definitely need you to be aware of is that you are not filing a claim appeal. Don't use the word a claim. You want the word overpayment. Don't use medical necessity if it's not related to medical necessity. If you're missing documentation, that is not a medical necessity appeal. That's a documentation appeal. It's two different actions, so make sure you're doing the right thing. If you don't agree with an allowed amount, then let us know that. Now, when does this one happen? You build with one unit of service, but it should have been three, and we allowed it for one unit of service, which means the allowed amount was much lower. Now, you could do an adjustment in the system, right? Clerical error reopening, or actually go in and, and do an adjustment. If not, you can do an appeal. Always, always explain why you disagree with the previous level. You can also move on to the next level if we didn't process those timely, which is within 60 days. And that's what we have the slide to tell us is what we have to have, when you have to have them processed by. So 11, one and two are different. Here's that five day question that we talked about. And I think this is probably where it came from is what is an extra five days? It's really 125 days because we do allow five days for mailing. If you do have questions and you're kind of struggling with this, we do have a redetermination calculator that will tell you the last date of file based on the date of the information given. So hopefully that gets you through the appeals information that you needed. And again, that information was just solely based on the questions that were asked uh, previously. So I wanted to make sure we had those. Question, first question that came in regarding that I'm going to talk about here is when I file an appeal, why is it dismissed? I don't have an answer for this and I'm not sure what you mean by this one because if you file an appeal, it might be dismissed due to the fact that you're saying it's a claim appeal, which means it's over 120 days, even though you really meant an overpayment appeal. So that would be my first tip is check that. 
that's where we get the most common one. Otherwise, you might have to give me some more information so I can help you out. When you utilize a third party payer, and we talked a little bit about this, is there a way in the uh, portal to find letters and other things that are sent? I did show you the portal and I did answer that question. Remember, you have to look at the overpayment sections under the claims transactions to find that information. All right, I'm going to keep rolling along here. We don't have a lot of time left. What's our goal? To help you succeed the first time to get everything done as quickly as possible. Again, we want to make sure that you aren't applying interest and having that doesn't need to be that you understand the overpayment process and why we're actually taking money back. So that was our goal today. With that said, we want to thank you for listening. We encourage you to sign up for additional webinars. We would really like your feedback on that survey and help us improve. Remember to include topics you want to see, not necessarily about overpayments or not about overpayments, but any topic you want to see. So on behalf of myself, Leanne, all of Provider Outreach and Education, thanks for participating. We look forward to your survey comments and seeing you at future events.